Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so what, what was the two works? No, no, Billion and? I mentioned quantum dynamic. Okay, yeah, states. I talk about quantum dynamics, so I'm going to disappoint you by not talking about non -abelian. So I consider uh, four of our works to talk about, but if you ask lots of questions, we're not going to get to the end, which is good. So, so try to interrupt me and as much as you can. Uh, otherwise, I have no idea what goes into your um, head. And uh, we're, um, let's see. <laughs> So uh, uh, just so you don't ask very hard questions, I want to say I'm an experimentalist, so I'm going <laughs> to uh, uh, say stuff that uh, my day job is about uh, microwave uh, uh, filters and uh, dilution refrigerators and uh, nanofabrications. But uh, so, so you know, uh, I don't do quantum field theory for a living. Uh, <clears throat> So like some of you. Uh, but anyways, uh, so uh, this is a hardware-based uh, talk. So uh, I would not use blackboards and whatnot. So I'm going I thought the good way to uh, bring you to what NISC devices do is just to walk you through a couple of the examples we have done and uh, we have published on. Um, so the starting uh, point uh, of our hardware, you can think about maybe about 40, 50 years ago. When you cool down a piece of superconductor, the Cooper pairs condensate to a Bose condensate, which can be described by uh, two parameters, amplitude and a phase, and uh, uh, called Ginsburg-Landau phase. And then when uh, Josephson, in I guess in late 1980s, he realized if you bring two pieces of superconductor next to each other, and each of them described by amplitude and then a phase, the phase difference between them now is a well-defined quantity, would, uh, would uh, lead, if there is a phase different, you would get a current between them. Cooper pairs can coherently tunnel from one side to another, and you get a, a persistent current, a current that can go uh, so long as this phase difference is maintained. And then uh, this is in contrast to a linear inductive elements, which the relation between current and flux and, or phase is linear. Now you have a sinusoidal one meaning that there is a higher order terms in the relation between uh, current and phase, uh, which, can, uh, which enables you to make a nonlinear um, elements, and that is very uh, crucial for, our, uh, uh, for our making our giant atom in a sense that if you make this element, put this element next to a capacitor, now you have make an LC circuit that you know from your undergrad textbook, but with a major difference, that instead of having a uh, um, linear uh, well, level of spacing, which you get for an LC oscillator, you have a nonlinear spacing. This non sorry, non-uniform spacing, which essentially comes from the higher order terms in the expansion of this sine or cosine that goes into these inductive elements. That's very important because now the energy between zero and one in your uh, harmonic potential is different than energy between one and two. One case is parabola, which energy level is uniform, you're very familiar with, uh, quadratic potential. Another case is cosine potential. As you go up and up in this uh, uh, potential, the level of spacing gets non and more and more non-uniform, and that allows you to address them. Meaning that you can go to the lab and make something like this. This is about 10 years old, done uh, at UCSB when most of the member of the team was at UCSB, so I can show it to you. Uh, it was not done at Google, so I can show it without risking my job. <laughs> but what you're seeing here is just a piece of aluminum and a lithography pattern carved on it, and someone for you did uh, photo, uh, uh, Photoshop it, paint the elements so you know which one is doing what. The, um, these elements are the capacitance I mentioned. These Josephson junctions are tiny things in here, and these two squares that you see are a coupling element. In fact, it's a, it's a qubit at a higher frequency. So you are seeing nine qubits next to each other in a 1D row, and then you see this uh, object on top of it, which is, a, um, which is a linear resonator, and is kind of tuned to know where if this associated qubit is occupied or not. Each of them has a different frequency, and its frequency can shift a little bit 
left or right depends in, uh, depend on his associated qubit is occupied or not. So you can send signals which is a frequency combination of all these uh, resonance of them and look individually that if each of them is slightly shifted or not from it where it was supposed to be in the absence of occupancy of these qubits. So the state of all these qubits can be run in one shot. And that, that's become important in the experiments you're about to see. Um, and you see a bunch of wires coming from below. These wires are used to move a qubit in its block sphere. And these middle wires are used to move the coupling between the qubits. So um, every term in the Hamiltonian of the system, um, which is, happens to be the bose hubbard Hamiltonian with uh, attractive U, uh, is real, there is enough to control it except, except the uh, Hubbard U, which comes from the nonlinearity, and that comes from setting the ratio of inductance and capacitance. When you choose that in your uh, nanofabrication, that sets this value of U, and after that, every ter other term you see is under the summation, so you can, you can control it however you like. So this is the device. Um, hopefully in the future, we are planning to just use this Hamiltonian and play with this term and create some uh, quantum dynamics. Um, but for now, we are going to turn on and off these terms to create to, uh, these textbook gates that you have seen, uh, swap and um, uh, C0 and CZ. So the, the way it's achieved is imagine everything is zero and then you turn it on and off and then you get the desired interaction. So the matrix, the four by four uh, matrices that you see in textbook, our goal is to realize them by, by manipulating these terms. So this is a Bose-Howard model for photons, right? Right. So, so the, 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 what we are saying is that if you excite a couple of these qubits, the dynamic that they follow is, is the dynamic of both Hubbard. They would uh, hop around and the double occupancy is, is rewarded, in fact, um, because how U is negative. Um, right. So uh, if you give it, uh, I guess if you give it enough time and if you could exchange energy somehow, it would pile up on one side, essentially. It's good? Okay. I'm just wondering, to choose sure. these values, what do we do So you, you, uh, you send a time-dependent signal through these lines. You can turn on and off a voltage. Because the off voltage is arbitrarily defined, kind of. Uh, you, can, uh, you can detune qubits from each other, and practically they don't talk with each other. Uh, or, or you can put them on resonance and get this coupling element to go to zero. So every, every, everything translates a to a voltage. And then adding a voltage on top of that time-dependent manner means that you're turning on and off this coupling and whatnot. I have a couple questions. So one, in your expression for the current, is that uh, rho, is that the difference, the phase difference? Between? Yeah, phase is only defined as a difference, yes. Right, okay. um, and so then in this actual like uh, picture here, uh, the correspondence between that and the figure, so is the superconductor one and superconductor two? Uh -huh. One is the one on top and one's on exactly. top. Exactly. So, so you, uh, you uh, evaporate, I guess, aluminum in the chamber. And then, uh, well, some areas like here and here, they're covered with some mask. So you lift off that mask. And then you end up with this part. Then you oxidize the entire chamber. Uh, there is a layer of oxide, about 5 nanometers formed. And then you evaporate again aluminum on a perpendicular direction. So about 200 by 200 area between them is filled with uh, uh, aluminum oxide. So here they're juxtaposed next to each other. Here they're sitting on top of each other. Yes. So for the second sum term, uh, is I only connected to the I minus one and I plus one? In this yeah, case? yeah. It's only nearest neighbor uh, hopping. Uh, uh, you can put some energy and define things differently and go there, but uh, we are at the courtesy and mercy of surface code people, so we have to make we have to use piggyback the device that serves the surface code people. Uh, we are not that much uh, thinking outside the box of making other terms and whatnot, but uh, you can think about engineering them, but it's very costly. So there, there's rich amount of physics to do while you're maintaining only nearest neighbor coupling. Well, for the um, resonance frequency, let's say we have you know, a, a qubit on the left side and a qubit on the right side. Uh -huh. um, how close can I make the resonance frequencies together? Well, so uh, um, what, um, 
resonance of the readout or of the qubits? So the, every qubit has, a, right. So let's say about 100 or 200 megahertz, uh, I think can be accommodating all these resonators. But you know, you can put eight, giga, eight gigahertz readout in here, but then 7.9 gigahertz doesn't need to be next to it. It can be over there. So you kind of make them, every qubit can be at between, I don't know, five and six gigahertz during operation. But the readout elements are one or two gigahertz different from there. It could be above or it could be below. And you can jam maybe up to 200 megahertz uh, space their, their readout resonator from each other. Maybe you can go up to 50 megahertz if you really pay close attention. Yeah. Good. That concludes our experimental part of the talk. OK. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, so first, I want to talk about this picture, uh, not this picture. This is my team. This is our team four years ago. I want to talk about that work that you heard. Uh, I, uh, so it's, uh, may I, hopefully, it's your first time you're hearing it. Probably your first time you're hearing it from me. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, our team is uh, uh, known to did the quantum supremacy experiment, beyond classical experiment, which landed about four years ago. But the idea is, is, is this, uh, uh, a decade-old uh, challenge, in a sense, proposed by uh, or, or popularized by um, John Preskill, saying if qubits or it's just quantum processors is good for any, something, there might be, sh they should be do anything. Like some, they got to do at least do one thing. You choose your own task. You cho choose what you like to do. And then show us that you can even do that before you factor numbers and uh, uh, optimize portfolios or whatever we are promising these days. Can you just do anything that you choose yourself to do? And that's the premise of the experiment. And I want to explain to you what pillars that is resting on. Um, so let me the, define the experiment. And then you see the elements and the care that has gone into define, uh, God, executing these experiments. We have a two degrees of qubits. We're going to see some pictures like this often. The qubits are shown at cross. Uh, and uh, because historically, the capacity, well, in recent qubits, the capacitance is the shape of a cross. And the cup, there is a coupling between them. So we have a two degree of qubits. And then every experiment you're about to see is using a subset of qubits like this. You know, when you have them, you can turn off the coupling. You can define 1D structure, open loop, and whatnot. And then we have a bunch of operation, gate operations, which I going to guess that you have been uh, heard about them during this week quite often. Um, this symbol is an operation between two qubits. It's a two qubit gate. I think it's, uh, it's not something you find in textbook, it's but very close to uh, I swap gate. And the other one is single individual qubit rotations. So here is the challenge. You start from uh, initial state being all the qubits in the state 0. And you evolve this wave function that is, is, tri is trivial, is a product state, with several layers of these gates. And at the end, you do a measurement. But as I said, we can do all the make qubits at, at the same time. So you get a bit string, which is 53 digits long. It's a binary digit, uh, string of 53 digits. And the, your pr sampling from uh, probability distribution associated with the wave function of the system. And the claim is that we can do that faster than a supercomputer. Given the fidelities we have, we are loyally generating this bit string faster than a classical computer. Um, and this is for you. I don't know what this says. It says sharp p hard. OK? So someone, uh, some group of people, a team has spent some time to prove that this task is actually genuinely uh, hard. They found the computational complexity associated with this task. And I would not be able to shed light on it exactly what it means. But that is proven to be hard. But one thing I really want to emphasize, and we had a conversation before I came in here. Th this is always you should ask when you see, um, um, don't let these uh, um, news and whatnot to, um, to, to uh, 
deceive you. When you see a grid of qubit, you really have to look, ask for these uh, curves, which are showing you the, in, uh, the error. This is the histogram, accumulated histogram. It's not the, is the cumulative histogram. Empirical cumulative distribution function, <clears throat> which shows how much error you have in every element of it. This is a few years old. Uh, we can do better than this now, this readout error. Uh, I think it's more about 1% now. The other gates also improved a little bit, uh, um, which is substantial in retrospect. Uh, but, the, but this is the, the uh, destination. This is really set how f hard of a computation you can do. I'll, I'll show you how it enters the, the arena of the computation. But there are two things I want to make clear before. Um, um, I said the challenge, the problem we are choosing ourselves. It doesn't mean that it's, uh, it, but it, it means it's well posed. It doesn't mean that we just do a random thing. Because, you know, making something complicated is not hard. You just you can toss your keychain up in the air and it's a very complicated motion if you look at the pieces. And you can generate something complicated. Uh, you know, just you can go and try to describe this motion. It's hard if, you, if I ask you to describe the motion. But the, but, the, but the key concept to keep in mind is not that we can only generate it, but we can generate it in a controllable manner. We know what we are exactly generating. And I, I will try to prove to you. The other key concept to keep in mind, so this was the notion of complex uh, fidelity. I want to talk about complexity. Um, well, I, show you there, I showed you there is a per, uh, theorem, but also I want to show you uh, experimental result that we know it's complicated, uh, di dynamic. And one way to be sure that it's complicated dynamic is analogous to this one. If there are symmetries in the problem that is hidden to you, then the motion would be limited to parts of the Hilbert space. So you think you're working with a big Hilbert space, but since there are certain symmetries, that symmetries made you to avoid certain parts of the Hilbert space, and computation, in fact, is simpler than what you think. So you got to be breaking all the symmetries and whatnot in these examples that are familiar to you, the Sinai billiard ball, uh, that you know, there are not part of the Hilbert space. This is analogous, because I believe you guys know what these are. That, um, that uh, you, you would eventually ergodically exploring all available Hilbert space to you, and meaning that there is no symmetries. And the gates chosen in the circuit was such that to be sure there is no, there's nothing left. So that's a very key uh, uh, thing that I try to convince you as much as I can. And this is the way to um, provide experimental evidence for it. Um, imagine a group of six qubits or nine qubits or 12 qubits. So um, what you would do, uh, this is a small group of qubits. The Hilbert space is not large. So for instance, for nine qubits, you are talking about 512 possible uh, configurations. And you run the circuit for, uh, I don't know, let's say 10 layers or of 10, 10 cycles. And you measure bit string over and over again. But since it's a small uh, Hilbert space, you can know the probability of bit string associated with the dynamic that you have chosen. And here, you know, some scheme of counting. Uh, you just put the probability of that bit string in here, and so on and so forth. And you see, you can do it for a. 64-dimensional Hilbert space all the way to this 12 dimension, 2 to 12-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so you just say, what's the probability of each string? Because you're giving it some dynamics, okay? Now, uh, you're about to see my extent of expertise in mathematics, which is called np.sort. So I put all the bit string, which are tallest, to the left, and all this thing, there was a function called, they told me, I use that, so I just, Move them around, not me even. Uh, the thing did it. So um, there is a prediction for this shape. There is a prediction that how it is supposed to look like. And uh, here is the mathematics of it. And, and look at the logic, it's, it's a bit subtle, so it takes a bit of uh, faith, is not exactly proof. Um, a wave function can be written as a superposition or summation of bit strings, right? Not, nothing fancy there. These, sorry, these Cs are complex numbers, uh, which you can write it as these prefactors as real and imaginary part. Uniform exploration of the, uh, of the Hilbert space 
that what we are after. I was trying to show that is full ergodic. It can translate to saying that these distribution forming a Gaussian. And then, uh, and then if I could show that the real part, sorry, the, the amplitude is exponential, which I'm trying to show you, then, um, well, as you see, unfortunately, this arrow is one-sided. Uh, so it could come from different reasons, but maybe we, you just give me some benefit of the doubt. And we, I'm showing you this is the case, and I'm asking you to accept that you know, um, this is probably caused by this. So I, I'm, I'm missing an arrow in here, but I'm asking you to accept the fact that most likely it didn't happen by other reasons and whatnot. So this is the strongest evidence experimentally we can show. We can, we can really go and see how far they are different from exponential or whatnot. Um, uh, but anyways, the, the, this is the line of logic goes into it in case you see this Porter Thomas so-called distribution we are showing. So it's just sh to show that indeed we are, uh, we are really uniformly exploring algebra space. Now we get to the next piece of element, uh, evidence that is for supremacy, and that is the notion of um, um, fidelity. <clears throat> um, let me see. So we are going to uh, go to batches of qubit, bigger and bigger, and we are going to look into how, uh, with what fidelity we can, um, uh, we can generate bit strings. Of course, when the system size is uh, small, uh, we, can, um, we can go to our classical computer, get the wave function, get the probability associated with bit strings we are getting, and then we can compare some Shannon entropy, essentially, of uh, the probability of measuring a bit string, bit string uh, versus uh, the probab... Well, okay, let me, let me walk you. If you have small Hilbert spaces, you can compare the probability of these strings as they appeared versus the probability that they should have or come from classical computer. This Shannon entropy tells you something that you got to get. But the rest of the formula is just normalization and removing the chance and whatnot. There is nothing into this formula, right? You want to be sure that if someone is just tossing coins and have no Schrodinger coherent evolution, that person should get zero score. That's why this normalization and whatnot enter the formula. But this formula is also working when you can really speak of probabilities. Uh, when you go to a large system like 55 qubits, which is 10 million billion dimensional Hilbert space, then there's no way to get a bit string twice, let alone arriving at it so many times to know its probability distribution. So assuming Porter Thomas distribution, which I show you, assuming you're dealing with large system sizes, this formula goes in that limit, turns into something uh, like this, which is the equation one of that, that paper. You get a bit string x i, the probability of it, uh, as comes from your classical computer, is your fidelity, besides some normalization and whatnot. <clears throat> okay, so, um, but, but then um, the whole thing is to push the, to the limit that we cannot compute. How do we go there? How do we go to the limit we cannot compute? That's not simple. But we got lucky that um, fidelity, and, oh, sorry, computation of these bit strings is rather um, sensitively depend on how you or the, apply your pattern, right? Remember, there was a single qubit gate. Maybe I go a few slides back. Um, there is single qubit gates coming from uh, pi over two rotation around x, y, or halfway between them. That's called w. And there's these two qubit gates. But then you have an option of which qubit should talk. You talk to south, north, east, west. You have all these options, right? It's not, you, ha you have this option. And here I'm showing you some subtleties of, subtleties of this computation. If you do this pattern, uh, uh, and then uh, maybe I, I start here. If you do this pattern and then repeat itself, you do, uh, uh, this becomes actually classically very simple. Uh, you can compute that. It's, it's, well, not very simple, but it's rather manageable. However, if you, after you chose this four, the next round you're starting it, you just do a slightly change, A, B, C, D, C, D, A, B. And then after eight times, you just start repeating from the beginning. This subtle change makes this computationally hard, as, at least as far as I, we know up to this moment. And it makes this very, very computationally accessible. Uh, and we are using this, uh, this to verify what we are doing. 
and we are going to claim that by, by shifting this order, hopefully fidelities are not changing much, and, uh, and we are in the supremacy regime. So um, is, that, is that clear? Yes. I'm not sure I understood. So we perform the bottom circuit, and then we verify it classically, and then we assume, OK, our computer is correct, so we do the top circuit too. Exactly. Like, okay. So um, we come here, um, we do the bottom circuit, and uh, we are, we are, this is not computationally hard. We can just go and figure out what fidelity we get, all the probabilities we can compute. We do a little more too in it, which is that we kill every entangling gate between left and right. So you have two systems next to each other. We have 53 qubits, we have 27, 26, I guess, um, and thanks to each other, they don't talk to each other. You have two, two small systems, rather, running at the same time. This is not really a big system. There is no entangling gate connecting them. So here, regardless of the order, you can compute it. That's not hard. Then you go slightly deeper, the slightly more uh, sophisticated, meaning that you kill a couple of gates in the first layers, and then you apply these entangling gates between left and right in later layers. Okay. That gets a slightly more complicated, so you can still do it on, the, uh, on um, that side, but not on the computation, uh, on the uh, supremacy side anymore. Um, and then you do the final thing, which again, here you could still manage to compute its fidelity, but you cannot, uh, we only give an estimate of how long it would have taken if you had done it on a, uh, on a, on a classical computer. OK, so by now you should be noticing that I've been doing a little of cheating. So far, uh, this is a wave function computation by the classical computer, supercomputer. And we're asking too much from our classical computer. Our quantum processor is making errors left and right. And our, quantum, uh, our classical is asking full wave function loyal to Schrodinger equation and all that. You can relax that condition. You can say the bit strings that coming out of the classical computer can also have errors. So you can allow that to have errors. The times and whatnot get more simplified. So uh, by, by exactly the order of the fidelity over there. So this 600 years was wave function and it comes to four years and whatnot. But then now you can start putting the number. So that is the claim before, behind the 10,000 uh, years that we made uh, four years ago. Yes. How do you implement the error in the classical computer's calculations? Do you like cut off the uh, floating point? No, it's not. It's, I think this is the bond dimension in the matrix product state. It's in the, in the tensor networks, you kind of limit them. The, if the entanglement propagate faster than some rate, you just don't stop, keep tracking of it. Yeah. Um, in, uh, so, um, um, OK, I can let this go. Uh, I want to show you the time computation or not, just for you to know, uh, so that I don't make any wrong claim. Uh, if in this article we say that, hey, look, uh, classical computers are going to catch up, and our quantum processor is going to get better. If we go and do this computation now, classically, I think it takes, I don't know, less than a minute. So classical methods have improved a lot. But also our quantum number, the, our new record is further out. I think it's 23 and then 70 qubits or something. So everything is improved. This is four years old, but they're all working as we have predicted. Um, so maybe we talk a little bit about um, 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 the time associated with uh, computing these um, where is the time coming from, and where is the bottleneck? Yes. I had a question about the previous slide. I was a little confused about these uh, times. Which times are how long it took the, well, because you have data points up to 20 cycles, but those were all actually done on Sycamore? Or? The red, yeah, five hours to get this point, yeah. Okay. The, the, on, on that side, is not computationally hard. You can calculate it. As soon as you change the order of the gates, it's become hard. And I, believe, I want you to believe that the gate fidelity is not the processor fidelity is not sensitive to which gate is applied to what layer, but the computational complexity sensitively depend on it. So in this side, I cannot compute them 
but I want you to believe that I know the fidelity. The fidelity is not different. You can't compute them classically or even quantumly? No, you, classically you cannot compute them. Quantum, with quantum, every 200, every 1 million bit string comes out every 200 seconds, regardless of who you are. It just comes every bit string. Quantum processor puts out bit strings uh, with a very high rate. Uh, to, uh, 1 million bit string in 200 seconds. It just comes out. But when you go to classical computer, you can only do anything associated with the wave function or making bit strings only on this side. On here, you have to just take my word for it. That has the same, yes? Is the bottleneck just evolving the, like the, the time dynamics? Or is it actually from sampling the state once you've prepared it? Classically, sorry. So is the classical bottleneck to simulating this just actually evolving the shorting? I, I get to it, OK. Um, oh, I just wanted to ask. Um, is it okay that like the uh, it, it seems to me like the sampling is like pseudo random and like the way you select the uh, permutations? Um, is there a reason why like pseudo randomness is enough rather than fully random? What, what, um, what do you mean pseudo random? Like, pseudo like it seems like you know you you like select a certain amount of permutations and then like you like repeat like. Um. You go and you choose your single qubit gates randomly. Again, it's beyond me, np dot random or something, right? So you just have three gates, square root of x, a square root of y, a square root of w, which is halfway through that. You pick up these randomly, and you put in your circuit, and the two qubit gates is set, and there you go. And then we say, OK, now let's evolve this trivial 0, 0 wave function according with this unitary. One side, we have a quantum processor. Another side, we have a classical computer. Yeah? Yeah. So the only random choice is this where you put square root of x and y and z uh, square root and w in the single qubit positions you have. Yeah. OK, so let's get to computational cost. Um, so uh, how long it takes to do these computations? Uh, so this is the number of qubits, and this is uh, how deep you go. And the color is how long it takes. Um, <clears throat> and I'm showing you in blue, in fact, uh, if you had done it in your laptop. If you have a laptop which goes to 30, uh, you can go in one minute, you can do 30 qubits if you have uh, two cores. You can go in one minute, you can go maybe 10 qubits and, uh, uh, sorry, depth 10 of 30 qubits. And if you want to go deeper, it doesn't much depend on time. And if you had, uh, if you had access to supercomputer, uh, you can go up to 40 qubits in one minute uh, uh, and, you know, reasonable depth. So you get there in, in, a, in a rather one minute for one million core, which is, I think, is typical. Um, however, Storing this wave function is very uh, taking so much time. So here's what uh, is important thing to say. Um, the, the size of the memory it takes is, is given up there. That's a very simple translating of uh, 2 to the n up here. So there is nothing fancy there. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, the summit supercomputer uh, is about 3 petabyte. And this is a petabyte of RAM. So remember, this computation has to happen in RAM. You just cannot do it on hard and move it back between hard and RAM. It's not, it's not possible. So, um, so long as we are limited to live on this planet, this is the size of the RAM we have. So you see the computation on a classical computer could take a day to go to, I don't know, 55 qubits or so. But it's beyond the RAM available in a supercomputer on this planet. So unless you don't live in this planet, you cannot pass this limit. It's, we're bound to this planet. So, so this, is the, this is the true cutoff. The wave function doesn't fit there. One, one more thing, and I think maybe I'm answering it. You're saying, OK, come on. That was very unfair. You have all these wave function, and it's just very, why can't you just get a little um, better than that, that you, know, you think about two patches that um, uh, evolve them, they would take far, far less space. And then you, in the spirit of Feynman diagram, consider how many 
ways you can stitch the left in, and the right in time, how many possible ways you could do that. So you can do trade-off in time and space, and that's what we are doing in here. And then you can fit it into your classical computer, sorry, in your supercomputer much better now, but still there is a trade-off. You see that now the red regions are coming down, but now you can fit it in your, uh, on your uh, supercomputer. You good? Yeah, I guess the, the question I was going to ask is like, is it because you're, you're, you're creating random circuits that the, the matrix that describes the unitary becomes dense, and so you, you don't really have like any sparse pattern that you can exploit? That, that's part of the pattern, yeah. All that Porter Thomas and all that, yes, yes, yes. Um, so uh, it seems like you're like, doing these simulations on a CPU-based cluster. So, but if, can, can you move these algorithms to like a GPU structure that, you know, that could make it faster by like, you know, parallelizing the multiplications and all that? Because that could like give it like an order of like, order of magnitude of like speed up. I don't know. I don't know. But the, um, but then the, the the hardware. Sure, things could change, but but. No, memory it, wise, yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. Time wise, you would. I can answer that. So Qiskit has GPU implementations, but it's there's only a limit. Like you can there's only a limit you can get to. So even if you do it on GPUs, and then I think the issue of moving things in and out of GPU memory, because you are, you're like, your memory is increasing exponentially. The GPU gets you so far, and some of the CPU implementations have almost primarily written in, like, vectorized instructions, AVX, so it's already really, really fast. I mean, yeah, I know, but I'm just saying because it's mostly matrix multiplication, and they do the same thing in, like, most machine learning or like so in these, these algorithms, readings. they don't like a lot of these simulation algorithms don't even use matrix multiplication. It's like they've optimized all the multiplication out. Okay. So it's like even with just instructions where you're adding, subtracting, a very simple arithmetic, it's like you can only get so far. Okay. <clears throat> but let me finish this part by going back to the notion of fidelity. Uh, again, uh, things get simplified if you have error, uh, right? You have to give your classical computer also benefit of the doubt because your bit string coming with error. And look, look at the error rates. Uh, uh, one of the errors I picked up, uh, so here is more or less error three. This is 1% error and this is 3% error. Uh, I think we are, we, when we did this experiment in this, in this Notation, I think we are close to 1% error, so a plot between the two. But by the time you get 3% error gates, the whole plot is green, meaning that the computer, your quantum processor is putting something that flip of a coin would have done as good as this. So it's very important to uh, talk about errors. Yes? Is that connected to the paper by Umesh Vatsirani, where they proposed yeah. an algorithm, but I thought they, they I said they know that there is an algorithm, but we don't know the algorithm. Or can you yeah, I, I, I think if things are not being exponential because of error going to polynomial, yeah. But at the end of the day, as, as we are saying, you've got to, well, at the end of the day, there is a number, right? You come up with your implementation scheme and say, oh, that takes a day. A day is not exponential or it's not polynomial, is a, is a number which we, claim we can outperform, yeah. So it's just hard to say it was, yeah. Okay, um, okay, let's just end this part on this uh, thing. Maybe it's, you're, you're not, maybe it shows how old I am actually, rather than how young you are. Uh, well, you might say that, hey, look, well, the whole thing was ergodic, you know, no matter what you do, you're just gonna work out. But I really like to show this plot, um, which is the first quantum realization of something which has been seen in classical, music, which um, Salieri was confessing that Mozart composition is so precise that if you change one tone, one note, the whole things fall apart. So that's a classical music. Now we have the same thing in, in fact in our circuit. If I pick one of these cube, uh, single qubit rotations and I change it, but I don't tell my classical computer or the, somehow there's this mismatch, the fidelity drops by two orders of magnitude. So the fidelity you saw, it was not just, it's not gonna work. You really have to get all the way to a single qubit gates fully sorted out to get this uh, experiment to work. So I don't know, a few hundred years after uh, this, we saw the quantum version of uh, Mozart composition. Okay, um, 
let's let's move on to the first example of the rest of the things. If you, if you are good, you are good in here. Yeah. So um, um, yeah, this is this is the question is uh, coming to us every day that we chose a problem that we chose ourselves. We know that we are very good in ergodic dynamics. Uh, we define the problem ourselves and we beat the classical computer. How far and how well can we do in the problems that someone else besides us cares about? What is the problems that community of physicists, chemists, uh, people who deal with optimization cares about and how well we can do on those problems? What are the requirements? What is next, right? Um, well, what is next is there could be two things. One is that you don't make a fantastic qubit in terms of error rates. You make a, uh, OK qubits, 10 to the minus 3 error, and you make lots of them together. And you make a logical qubit, and you rely on the error correction theorems and whatnot, and that logical qubit acts as this perfect qubit. They can survive and live, uh, have a good longevity. And you go through this path. That is not what we are going to talk today. What we are going to talk today is our effort to climb up this path, meaning that we are going to discuss the, well, the next lowest hanging fruit, non-equilibrium dynamic problem, spin models and whatnot. And we try to say things that maybe someone else besides us care, and we are ans answering some interesting questions. OK, that, that's the thinking in there. And um, from this group of experiments we have done recently, I chose several of them for you. So let me go to the first experiment, and you can see the uh, uh, publication details of it and whatnot in here. <clears throat> Okay, um, again, this is a very ancient problem, has been discussed by the, uh, by the um, Greek, uh, and it's captured in this uh, fresco. I don't know if you have read that detail when you walked into Vatican, but clearly they are talking about bound state of photons. So in the next few minutes, I'll try to de demystify a couple of words for you. Bound states, photons, and integrability, okay? So that's our goal. And uh, what do I mean by bound state of photons and what this integrability means and whatnot? Okay, so that has been discussed for many ages. <clears throat> and, and I like this problem because it has been discussed and uh, it's been simulated, the simulation of it has been discussed by cold atoms and the whole experiment has happened in cold atom setting about a decade ago. And now our platform is catching up and we are getting to a very interesting time in history that. Uh, that platforms are uh, doing the same problem. So the problem is the, uh, the um, Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Heisenberg, what did I call it? Uh, X, Y, Z. If delta is one, you have Heisenberg. But I guess delta doesn't need to be one for this part of the talk. The beta ansatz uh, solution existed about a century ago. And then there was a prediction for existing of the bound state. And it was observed uh, soon after it was predicted uh, uh, by the team led by Emmanuel Bloch uh, in 2014. So what they found is that if you have two excitations, two magnons next to each other, they would stay together. When they come back and look at the dynamic, there's the chances that they are together is far more than the chances that they are separate, living separate from each other. In this sense, these two magnons are bound together, okay? And we are going to uh, copy them, and we are going to do the same experiment in our setting. <clears throat> well, with a couple of differences. We don't have the Hamiltonian evolution that they naturally have. We do have a Floquet evolution. And you're going to see this over and over again. Let me introduce them. So, uh, and I'm going to use this um, schematic. In a ring of 24 qubits, remember I said that you can choose your qubits and turn off coupling, and you can define rings, structure, and whatnot. In a ring, or two, the qubit 24 is next to qubit 1. We are going to uh, apply these unitary gates, which, have, uh, which, which you can really see their corresponding relation with the XXZ Hamiltonian. There is a hopping term. Uh, there is a, in fact, there is a complex hopping. You can accumulate a Peirce field a phase uh, as, you, as you hop. Um, and then there is an interaction term similar to XXZ Hamiltonian. And we are going to uh, apply these gates between even an, uh, in, in every cycle, you do it twice. So every qubit is connected. And for this uh, configuration, for this uh, set of flocket operations, there has been a prediction by uh, our colleague uh, Igor Aliner that um, 
well, the, the first prediction, I think, is come from team of Tomas Prozen, who said that this is also integrable. Um, and then uh, if it's integrable, then there are most likely there's a bound state for it. And Igor Aliner wrote the analytical forms for the bound states. OK. <clears throat> But what's the big deal about the bound states? We're going to see, uh, you might see uh, excitons like in a semiconductor setting, right? These, these kind of um, excitations in a semiconductor setting, they are usually stable because they are in the semiconductor gap. There are nowhere for them to decay. I'm going to show you something rather surprising. We have a bound state forming energy. This is quasi energy now I'm showing on a circle. And they are stable, but they are also overlapping with the continuum. So they are, have adjacent energies to decay to, but they don't decay to them. And that is the, that's as a result of the integrability of the system. And that is, in a sense, unique about them. This is what we are about to do. Uh, we are going to excite three qubits. Uh, and we are going to evolve it with this unitary evolution. And we're just going to take a snapshot of it. We evolve it for one cycle. We take 10,000 snapshots, we evolve it for two cycles, we're going to get several thousand snapshots, and so on and so forth. And we're going to say what bit strings we are collecting. Okay? This is photon conserving, so always you're going to get a few bit strings. In a, practically, you don't, but you can post select on those choices. Um, so why interaction should lead to formation of bound states? Why, when they are interacting with each other, they don't have any chance to go away from each other. Um, how can interaction help? I'm trying to give you an intuitive picture of this. Okay? Here, here's the intuitive picture. Let's say uh, they are together in the beginning of time. This axis is time. And then later on, they are not together. They start together, and then later on, they are not together. Right? This, prob this, this process is the sum of all possible path that connects one to another. And I'm showing you a couple of feasible scenarios. In path one, they are together for a couple of times, and then they just try to break off from each other and whatnot. But when they are next to each other, they are accumulating a phase. right? So depending on where they break off from each other, the phase that they accumulated is different. And then when you go and add them up, uh, uh, you, you add the, 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 not the amplitude, right? You add the, the whole uh, things together bef before you get rid of the uh, complex number. They would do destructive interference because now you're adding a bunch of complex numbers as a, as a prefactor of these scenarios. Every one of them has a different um, complex phase accumulated. And as a result of it, they would interrupt was possible that they inter interfere destructively. These, these thing terms add up, and they would uh, then this part, this scenario would be suppressed. I, am I following? Okay, good. Uh, oh, yeah. So is it? Is I'm trying to associate interaction with uh, with uh, um, with being together, right? How can they be together when there isn't? So let me show you some um, simple results. A ring of 24 qubits, it, this is here. And you excite one qubit, and you watch it how it evolves. And as I said, after each cycle, you take a snapshot. And where you find a bit string, you associate the color with it, or where you found the bit strings. You average it over many, many observations at each cycle, and I'm showing it in here. This is one excitation in here. There is nothing for it to bound to. And it's just a simple random walk of a lonely particle. <clears throat> but when you put two excitations together next to each other initially, you can see that it seems they are starting to be together, and the, the, the tendency of them to break off is getting suppressed. As you put more and more next to each other, you can see some concentration of color, meaning that the probability of finding them next to each other is increased. And they, it seems they don't like to go get away from each other very much. Let me, let me um, uh, make it a slightly even uh, more um, visible to you. Um, so the bit strings that I'm collecting, all of them has NPH number of uh, excitations in it, right? And uh, this is a photon conserving uh, evolution. I can separate them into two buckets. One bucket is the bit strings that they are two together. Another is the 
group of bit strings that they are not together. Something broke off. They are, they are not all adjacent to each other as I put them separately. Okay, for, for, for the time being, I'm just going to show you where I found these guys. I'm going to put the S bit strings in a, aside. I'm not showing you what they do, but I'm going to show you that the position of these two when they are together. Okay, I'm showing the position of center of these two bit strings, of, of bit strings of this type, together bit strings. And you can see, you see exactly the same pattern as the one. Meaning the two of them, after this filtration I have done, now you can see that they're happily walking together and that is becoming very evident from after this filtration. And I can continue to three and four and five. Again, uh, there are five excitations, so I can just, whenever I found them, I can highlight one pixel in here. And you can see that, in fact, the center of the mass of this object is not moving much. Yes? So uh, those patterns we see, like the first uh, top left one, yes. the quantum of that, it goes at, does it uh, have the reflection effect that it goes to the boundary and come back? Yeah, yeah when, when it gets to 24, it's at 1. It goes, yeah, it's a ring. It goes out, and it's right there. These graphs are, are they like out of like a uh, result of a simulation or actual experiments? Oh, like, you, if you wish it, no, of course it's experimental result. <laughs> <laughs> Why should I wait your life with showing you simulations? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that, okay. <laughs> okay, so I can draw a line, which is the propagation of the front. And I can extract the velocity of how the front propagates. And it's a lot better be following what uh, Igor Aligner predicted. That's the solid line. And that's the extracted velocity of propagation of the front of this. Um, OK, we might need to get worried about this later on. <clears throat> OK, maybe I'll pass over this one. So um, I'm going to, um, well, maybe I say some words on this one. Uh, uh, these are experimental results. Uh, <clears throat> and I want you to, uh, to appreciate the significance of this. Uh, you guys notice that the bit strings, that they are together, right? You have a ring of 24 qubits. The case is that they are two, three together. There are only 24 possibilities. But the, 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 um, the number of uh, size of the Hilbert space is much bigger than that. The all possible configurations that these three bits, three excitation could have is far bigger than uh, than uh, 24, right? So this is uh, n cube. This goes. Uh, this is very different. And so, so meaning this, if you look at these possible configuration that things are not together, is is exponentially more of them. And there's only tiny linear segment of this whole exponentially, right? For when when um, when n is large, right, you, you're going to be almost 2 to the n, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so they have many, many places to go, and they yet they, in, the, in the computational basis, in the available Hilbert space, and yet they don't go. And that's the significance of it. They start to a tiny part that is linear with the dimension of the Hilbert space. So here I'm showing you, for instance, two photons. They start together. These are blue. And then you see as, as time goes up to 60 cycles, they are really in this uh, uh, close to wherever they started, meaning that there is no vacancy between them. However, if they don't start together, they are, they are wandering in this very big exponential space, and they go have any possible separations you find in here. Again, when you can have like five photons, you come there, and you know they, they break. They are not always uh, staying together. And you can find them in maybe different configurations. But if you, if you are somewhere different, starting some configuration like this, then after you come back, you get all possible configurations, and, uh, because that's exponentially far more of them. Anyways, um, so that was another thing. So we're going to do a little um, 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 math together because um, I want to please those who are coming from maybe condensed matter background and they are familiar with momentum space measurement. I want to show you that now we can look at these bit, st these bit strings in momentum space. But I need to tell you a little about the math that you know. 
<coughs> you have a Hamiltonian, let's say, for now. Forget about the flocket dynamics. The same thing applies over there. But for uh, my laziness, we're just going to use Hamiltonian. A Hamiltonian has eigenstates and eigenenergies. And uh, the evolution of the, uh, when you have a wave, uh, initial state, which can be written as the, as, as ex has an expansion in terms of the eigenstates, it evolves according to Schrodinger equation, as you guys know better than me. Somehow, magically, you could get the overlap of a wave function with its uh, initial wave function, okay? You just make this complex number, the two wave function overlap. Um, this would be, simply would be uh, an amplitude, a, a real number, times uh, exp uh, exponential terms, okay? You guys could see the math, right? Um, but that is very beautiful looking in a sense that if you could make this object, you could Fourier transform it. If you get this left side, you can Fourier transform, and the Fourier transform of this complex number gives you all as energies of the system. Okay, so that's a dream to have. You come up, you wake up, your next day, you come up with this idea, which is the realization of this dream, okay? That's a superposition, that's an overlap, and here's what happens. So I, let me just tell you, you can go home and try, that if you have one qubit in the, um, in a superposition of zero and one, your square root of x, bring your zero to zero plus one, and if this unitary is um, photon conserving, meaning doesn't take you to other manifolds, um, when you evolve the wave function and you measure this non-Hermitian operator, uh, um, uh, yeah, then, then that lowering operator is exactly what we have dreamed to have. In this, when u is f um, excitation conserving. You might see it in a different context, I, I don't know. Uh, um, but that is what uh, it is. So how do you measure a non-Hermitian operator? You do two measurements. You measure this x2 and you measure y, and then you just add them together with a complex prefactor. Okay, so that's the magic. You can convince yourself of this. Um, well, uh, how about you have two photons? We want to go two and three photons and whatnot. The lazy solution, you can do slightly better than this. You can put two excitations, uh, two uh, qubits on equator. So you make this superposition. Uh, well, you can do, it, you, you, these two last terms you don't need, but if you just do the lazy thing, you get this extra thing which you can ignore. And then the lowering operator I said is more complicated. Now you have to do four independent measurements, record them, put them together, make a complex signal, and Fourier transform uh, this guy. And I can show you that you can go with this photon conserving business, you can go higher and higher, and you can really get this uh, complex signal, which is Fourier transform will give you the um, <clears throat> a spectrum of the system. Okay, so let's get going. Um, let's show me, I want to show you an example for two excitation. Um, to only four qubits, as a function of time, you measure these lowering and raising operators, I said. You plot them, you come back to me and say it looks like garbage. And I tell you, well, you know, do two Fourier transform. The, the energy scale, trans, uh, the, the side transfer to momentum, and this time transfers to energy. And the Fourier transform of that, when you add those four terms with correct prefactor, is this beautiful uh, uh, thing, which looks like tight binding, but it's not exactly tight binding. It's slightly different. Um, um, but anyways, uh, we have the analytical form for it. So you can go through the... Recipe I said is not scalable because by the time you get to five excitation, you have to add 32 terms. But you know, if grad students are free, so you can get them to use them to do this. And you can see this band getting more and more flat and you can do something that hopefully speaks to the heart of someone who has seen ARPES data or something that this is really resolving uh, energy versus momentum for the band of this. That's very good. And we can go further and we can, um, uh, we can in fact, okay, so let me show you another magic which makes the condensed matter people maybe hopefully jealous by now. <clears throat> and I, I told you this beta is the, this, the uh, complex phase. As photon hops, it's very simple for us to realize this 
unitary evolution, meaning that the, comp the, uh, the hopping has a complex phase to it, okay? And, um, and if you close the loop, which we do, the sum of these betas is the flux going through the loop. So you can really make a ring and you can get the magnetic field tuned through it. Uh, uh, this is the magnetic flux going through this loop and you can look how your electrons respond to this magnetic field, in this case photons. So you can get the photons to respond to magnetic field. I have no idea what this is. <clears throat> and you can change this beta and then beta times NQ is the flux and you can you slowly change this beta factor and you can look this, that these bands are beautifully going, moving in front of your eyes. And the rate of the, that they move, of course, give you the pseudo charge of the, of the uh, quasi particles associated with these bands. And you can go and extract this uh, quasi uh, charge. And when the final result is a bit boring, when you had five photons, the quasi charge was five and four and so on and so forth. But you can really, uh, well, hopefully, maybe in the future, we do it in a more useful setting. But you can see that you can really play with, uh, get the momentum, and you can play with the, um, play with, uh, with the magnetic field in these bands. Okay. Um, so um, I told you that these, uh, these, uh, uh, um, these bands, uh, these physics is all resting on the fact that we were working with the system which is uh, integrable. And in the language of young, young Baxter, it means that the order of the scattering, if you have three particles coming and scattering from each other, the order of which two they scatter first doesn't matter. It's a, it's a very magical thing that you have adding big scattering numbers and somehow magically they cancel each other. But, um, but the non-interacting physics, sorry, the um, integrable system, sorry, integrable systems which follow this equation um, are really tiny sets of generic uh, uh, Hamiltonian systems or unitary uh, or, or flucket systems, you know, of interacting systems in general. Meaning they have been fine-tuned for historic reasons because we want to build some understanding and we want to do it. Um, <clears throat> So it's, it's like an Achilles heels of theories because they want to be on that thing, but it's actually the other way around, meaning that uh, Achilles has only one vulnerable point. Here, the, everywhere is vulnerable, except that very tiny sets that uh, we have been historically familiar with and developed many, many theories. So when you creating something integrable is hard, breaking it is very easy. So of course we're going to do this next in the lab. But also we had some, used some oracles which told us exactly that, you know, when you're dealing with the integrable system, you have to really go and break integrability and see what happens. So the break integrability, uh, what we do, we make a ring of uh, 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 14 qubits and we add uh, an extra qubit every one, every other qubit. We are going to two, uh, quasi to the structure. Integrability was proven and existed in 1D, and now we are going quasi 2D. <clears throat> but the way we do it is that as every layer of FSIM gates finishes, we, we would do a layer of gates that couples us to these extra qubits. And by doing that, by adding 7 qubits to 14 qubits in this photon conserving case of, of the case of three excitation, we have really have uh, four times more Hilbert space to go into. So, so let's see how our system behaves. Intuitively, um, um, if you ask a theorist before showing them the data, <clears throat> well, you're breaking integrability and you remember I said that you have this bound state in the presence of a continuum. So they're quickly going to go away. They're not going to survive. As soon as you break the integrability, Fermi Golden Rules tells you that the, uh, there is an overlap and then there's the density of states that the presence, the continuum density of states and the overlap of what you have with that continuum, it tells you that it got to go away very quickly and it got to uh, disappear uh, very rapidly. But now probably you know that's not the case. So on the vertical axis, I'm showing how many t-bit strings I have meaning how much bound states are staying together. What are the likelihood I find together? I, if nothing was broken, this line would have been flat as a function of time cycles. And you can see as we increase this theta prime, 
theta prime being the strength of this perturbation. Um, if, of course, you make theta prime very, very strong, you do a very strong perturbation, the bound states go away very rapidly, and this, uh, this dashed line is just drawn by hand to sh that probably if you just, you, you ask a tourist what it would look like before showing the data, they would do that. But what is interesting is that uh, when theta prime is as strong as the dynamic in the chain, uh, uh, the decay rate is not changing. So this is, uh, in theory, this should have been a perfect line, which should have been flat, but the rate is going down even in the absence of perturbation because we have dephasing and whatnot in the system. Um, so, so this is your kind of baseline, but you see the up to very strong perturbations, still you are not breaking these uh, bounced states very much. Um, and I can show you more data that shows that very, very uh, slowly they, they go away. Let me show you two cuts through the same data set. And you can see as the strength of the perturbation changes at these two cuts that are made in here, uh, uh, the, the bound states are staying together for a good time, and then they eventually, of course, go away. This is, this is totally unexpected. One would guess that this would go, it would go down much, much faster. I can show you the, the same thing in the momentum space picture. We worked out all these momentum space pictures, so uh, we can show it that here is the, bound, the band of these bound states, and it goes away eventually when the perturbation become very strong. But here you plot the full with half maxima or some measure of the size of the peak, and you can see that, again, in contrast to a naive guess, which says, oh, they're gonna go away very quickly, the peak survives for a long time, and then it becomes weaker and weaker in the later time. So they are there uh, beyond our expectation. And we ended up that manuscript by saying that we don't know why they are so uh, resilient. Uh, what's the reason behind it? We made a couple of guesses, but definitely new territory that was not discussed before. This is just a naive question. But I mean, is the math behind the calculation that you did like some sort of like Floquet theory when you have your perturbation and you compare with the other dynamics. Um, no, I said two things. These are experimental results. <clears throat> but I'm saying if you didn't have any of this and you want to guess it, you would say that I have a band at the, in the, at energetically coexisting with a continuum. And as soon as there is no symmetry protection by integrability, the bound state should go away very quickly. So I didn't do any numerics yet. Next, I'm gonna show you some numerics. So numerics shows that um, indeed what we see is repeated in the numerics. Remember, these are not computationally challenging at all. These are, I don't know, Hilbert space of 800 or few thousand or something you can do in your laptop. Uh, uh, but, but you can look at the level of statistics and whatnot, and you can see that um, um, indeed the, the, the whole level repulsion is in there, so the full integrability is gone and whatnot. So um, what I really um, want to, uh, uh, and the, the, the bound state are stable. So um, um, now I want to show you something that we are very, very happy about. So we ended that manuscript by saying that we don't know what happened, why they're so stable. And we put the manuscript out about a year ago, but early this summer, um, without us talking or um, paying them or anything, this group of researchers, one in UK, one is down the street, or I guess on the other side of 101, um, they picked up this problem and they investigated very seriously. Uh, and I'm very happy that we initiated this effort. Um, <clears throat> The first group at Leeds, they did extensive numerics, and they say that yes, at the limits that the Google processor worked, that's exactly what you would see. But if you go to half filling, if this number gets close to 12 and whatnot, and this number gets bigger, probably this goes away. Uh, so there was a numerics, they, they would say that. Um, but also they very much looked into the level of statistics to be sure that the perturbation indeed broke the integrability. And then they say that uh, yes, uh, in the limit that uh, the size get large and this number stays small, the number of excitation, the numerics shows that uh, the bound states are robust. <clears throat> the, 
The second team at uh, Caltech, they looked into why they are small. Uh, so they, they went to the band structure we ha that they, we have, uh, we, that we measured, and they say it's correct that these band energies are overlapping with each other. But you have to see who is exactly overlapping with who. So you get the energy bands is one thing, but, but going and seeing what, what configuration is going to that energy band is a different thing, which they did with CARE, saying that how much of these bands is made of this configuration, how much is made of that configuration, and whatnot. But by asking this question, they realize that, well, um, the bands that are made of this have not much overlap with the bands that are made of two together and one separate. Those are energetically very different from each other. These, the four bands associated, I don't know why four, but well, because of the way they divide, I guess. Uh, uh, these bands are up here, um, and, and these bands associated with two plus one are, are down in here. So they are not energetically together, so the golden rule would not immediately imply. Um, but the bands that are coexisting, giving this yellow background, are these ones. And, and uh, for some reason, there is a very small matrix element between them. So they kind of maybe shift the mystery by saying that, well, uh, maybe intuitively you could have seen that for this one to decay, it has to decay to this and then this one, right? For, for three things, to you have to separate one and then separate the other one. And that is energetically just non-existing. One is up in energy, the other one is down in energy. And the other one is just happened that the matrix element is small. But why the matrix element is small is for you to figure out. OK. I can stop in here. Yeah. OK. Let's start.